Welcome back to the podcast, Alan. Thank you, Peter. Thanks for having me. Of course. So um, it's been it's been uh, four years since uh, since we last chatted on the show, and I know a lot has happened. But maybe before we get started, for those listeners that don't know Share States well, why don't you just um, share how you describe the company today? Sure. Uh, so Share Estates is a, a business purpose mortgage loan marketplace platform. Uh, so we essentially have created a marketplace for borrowers, real estate speculators uh, to come online, submit loan applications, handle their loan application and loan sourcing needs completely digitally. Um, and once that loan is actually underwritten and closed by our system, we then make that loan available via our investor marketplace to both whole loan institutional investors as well as individual retail investors and smaller uh, institutions for syndicated investments. Right. Okay. And, and, what, and what geographic footprint are you working in today? We have lent in a total of about 34 or 35 states uh, with a heavier concentration in the Northeast, New York, New Jersey, metro markets. Right. All right. Okay. Okay. So then maybe you can just take us through the developments in the company. I want to sort of get to do this in two segments. So, you know, we chatted four years ago and obviously I'll link to that in the show notes and, um, you know, take us through sort of the developments of share states through the beginning of this year. Sure. Um, so when we first launched this business, we came at it from a slightly different angle than everybody else. Um, you know, we were not finance guys. We were not technology guys. We came from this from a, a real estate background and more specifically a title insurance background. Uh, so going back to 2015, when we first launched, we had a pretty robust database of speculators and developers that we used essentially as a springboard to launch the business, um, which enabled us to do a couple of things really you know, quickly uh, and enabled us to get to profitability relatively quickly, uh, which kept us from having to go down the VC private equity route of raising capital to grow the business, allowed us to control and grow the business the way we wanted to, uh, which was fantastic over the last five years uh, we were able to scale that business um, to about two and a half billion in origination volume through the beginning of uh, 2020. Um, Pre-COVID we had gotten up to just about a hundred million a month in origination volume. We had grown the team to north of a hundred people. Um, we built a ton of technology uh, that pretty much supports our entire business from A to Z uh, which has helped us you know to scale the business without having to have you know, three or four times the staff. And we've been able to do that all profitably, just constantly reinvesting and growing the brand and growing the technology and our network. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, great. So then obviously we have things, things change earlier this year, but I was listening to an interview you did recently that's where you, you shared that you actually had kind of, um, you know, business continuity plans and you sort of, you actually had drafted up some of this, uh, some of the documentation which you said at the time you thought was not going to be useful at all and ended up being use pretty useful in, in hindsight. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, um, it was definitely an interesting transition going from a very office oriented workspace to pretty much having everybody through today even continuing to work at home. Uh, so part of the technology that we built was um, we essentially have two different departments that handle all of our technology and IT. Uh, so we've got one group of developers uh, that's comprised of about 30, 29 or 30 developers that are actually building our share state software. So that's everything that you see from our online portals, um, the vendor portals for title companies, appraisers, uh, brokers, investors, et cetera, all the way through our borrower portals and all of our backend systems. And that's all basically cloud-based, which enables us to really be able to work from anywhere. And then we have a separate external group uh, that handles pretty much all of our computer IT and office needs. So making sure that all of our laptops and hardware are secure, that we're using VPN access uh, and dual, you know, dual factor authentication to log into our tools and things like that. Just, you know, obviously making security a, a very big focal point of this whole work from work from home concept. Um, but the, the beauty of all this is that everything that we've implemented over the last five years enabled us to transition to a work from home environment relatively quickly and easily. Um, so at this point, you know, we have give or take 100 people working remotely, uh, able to interact with each other and really do their day to day jobs just through our online proprietary systems. Everybody's tied into each other. There's workflows, there's communication happening through, uh, you know, the system notifications and pretty much everything anybody needs to help move those files along from application to close 
uh, and then through post closing and servicing pretty efficiently uh, and without mm -hmm. any. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So then, so let's just take us through the developments from, from earlier this year. You know, the, um, the pandemic hits and, you know, sort of everyone closes their office, but in, you know, in the real estate space, there's, there's sort of a, a drying up of, uh, of capital. And I imagine you guys were, were pretty impacted uh, by that. So tell us a little bit about how, how, how you were impacted and how you handled sort of that initial, initial shock. Yeah, so <clears throat> I think it's important to differentiate the different types of lem lenders that exist out there and kind of the pros and cons of each. Um, yep. You have people that are kind of playing in the same sandbox uh, of our product type. So loan size is anywhere from 100,000 up to, you know, ballpark seven and a half million covering residential, multifamily, and mixed-use asset classes. Um, and we're all kind of set up a little bit differently. So you've got some groups that are purely captive financing. So they've got funds, they've got uh, direct capital that they control, that they lend out. Um, so they are essentially the originator and the investor in one. Um, those businesses are great because they, they really do have full control over their capital stack. Uh, the limitations with that type of a structure tend to be that um, you don't have the same level of scalability, meaning you don't have as much capital available to you as you do under a structure like ours because we're dealing with dozens of investors. So we're never really limited by how much cash we're managing. Um, then you've got companies that are more like mortgage banker type setups um, or you know originate to sell type structures like share estates, which again also has pros and cons. Uh, so the pro being that we've got dozen, dozens of institutional investors. We've got our syndication platform with hundreds, actually probably at this point, thousands of active investors. Um, and that creates diversification of capital sources. And, you know, we can do hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars on an annualized basis uh, without having to go out and actually raise more capital. It's much easier to onboard in an existing investor and grow your investor base than have to go out and set up a whole new structure and... Mm -hmm and actually raise capital. Mm -hmm. um, and then within that, you kind of have a subset of uh, originators that are really kind of just selling to one or two counterparties, maybe three counterparties. They might have a right of first refusal mm -hmm. or some of, you know, strategic investment by the counterparty that they're selling loans to, um, which again, kind of takes you back to limiting your capital sources and in some cases could limit your flexibility or what we saw earlier this year, um, have an originator that's really um, beholden to a single investor, uh, if that investor decides to push pause or shut down, your business is shutting down with them for however long that may be. Um, we kind of sit somewhere in the middle. So we don't have direct capital that we control for the purposes of balance sheeting loans long term, but we do have a balance sheet uh, that's, you know, in the tens of millions. We do have warehouse lines that collectively bring us up, you know, north of a, a hundred million in actual balance sheet capital. Uh, and then we also have a very robust list of investors that we sell those loans to on a forward flow basis. And what that allows us to do is kind of get the scalability piece uh, while still having control and uh, capital that um, we have discretion with. And then at the same time, um, you know, in, for example, in COVID where many of those investors had to temporarily push pause and focus on asset management, because we had diversified those capital sources, we didn't go completely dry. Uh, we definitely felt it. Um, we, had, we saw different types of investors react in different ways. Uh, but the thesis that we had kind of thrown our business on was if you diversify capital sources, you should be able to survive a downturn because the likelihood of everybody turning off at the same time um, you know, is more remote than if you're beholden to you know, one or two investors. And that's basically what happened. We had, you know, um, probably about a 60 to 70% decrease in overall capital availability from our institutional partner. Uh, but the syndication side of the platform and the smaller unleveraged institutions continued to actually invest through the COVID pandemic, um, supporting existing loans, funding draws, and even funding transactions. Yeah, that, that, that's, um, that's interesting to me. So the, cause you obviously got, you've got individuals that are making their own decisions and that have been with, been with you for a while in many cases. So the, what you're saying is those people really stayed with you and just kept, because a lot of this is just reinvesting. It sort of turns over fairly quickly. So was that group much more sticky than the institutional group? 
Yeah, so what I, what I would say is the smaller institutions, the fractional investors and the high net worth accredited investors were actually stickier than the larger institutions. Right. I've learned through this experience that it's, it's not a, a relationship that's controlling that, it's the capital structure and capital source that's, that's controlling that. So what I mean by that is, um, you know, everybody thinks that you get into bed with larger institutions and that means scalability. And that's true, it does. Um, but it's not sticky capital and it doesn't matter, you know, what that relationship looks like. You could have, you could be best friends with the portfolio manager, um, that's, you know, in charge of the day to day and, you know, what loans they're buying, what they're investing in. But at the end of the day, the overall, you know, fund or institutional organization has other levers and limitations that they need to be concerned with. So these larger institutions by and large have leverage, you know, they go to, a Goldman Sachs, a Morgan Stanley, a Credit Suisse, other leverage providers, they have warehouse lines, they're levered up, you know, five to one, six to one, four to one, whatever their leverage is. And um, their ability to invest is directly tied to their cash availability from these warehouse lenders. Right. Or they could be reliant on the securitization market as an exit. Um, when those things kind of froze up in March, April, uh, where you had, you know, warehouse lenders doing margin calls, um, some you, you know, you could have had repo facilities where they're technically non-committed lines and they just freeze the line so you can't draw on it anymore. Um, or, you know, the securitization market blew up, then those institutional investors are basically stuck. They, they can't do anything. It's not their fault. It's just the nature of their capital structure. Uh, whereas the smaller unlevered institutions that are investing what I call pure equity um, or, you know, individual investors that, you know, might be investing five, 10, 15, $20,000 a deal, uh, that's their capital. They have discretion. They're not reliant on leverage and uh, they couldn't continue to invest. Right. right. To. So, <laughs> Thankfully so, was the case. Right. Right. So, so what about the other side of the marketplace, the borrowers who, you know, did that, did, did demand kind of continue throughout? I mean, how did the, 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 the demand for deals kind of uh, change uh, over, over the, over the course of the pandemic? Yeah, so um, again, break it out into two buckets. So you've got like your hot developer, which is a guy who's got a day job and might do one or two, you know, fix and flip projects or one real estate a year, if even that often. Um, and then separately, <clears throat> you have your seasoned speculators, developers that are doing, you know, half a dozen, a dozen projects a year. Um, we saw the less experienced hobby developers slow down for fear. We saw the more seasoned speculators, developers actually dive in deeper uh, because they see this as an opportunity. They see stress in the market. They see people that might be out of a job that might be looking to sell their home, uh, you know, stress situations that are an opportunity for them to make money. Second to that, uh, the overall pie, the size of the lender community shrunk overnight mm -hmm. drastically, right? I mean, I, I don't have any way to quantify that, but, you know, this is just a random number, but I'd say probably 90% of lenders just kind of shut down overnight, not permanently, but temporarily to see what the market was going to do as a result of, you know, that institutional capital issue. Um, that for us made the pie smaller, but we were one of the few lenders that was still active. Um, so the market demand was just exploding, right? Far right. beyond it even facilitate. So there was a ton of borrower demand, much it's supply and demand, right? Ton of borrower demand, less investor demand, which um, also made the loan programs a little wacky. Uh, so the investors that were still active in the space wanted super low leverage, secure product at 50 LTV and higher coupons, which also just made it a little bit difficult to do business. So some loans were happening, some deals were happening, uh, but the volume of those transactions dropped significantly. Right, right, okay. Okay, that makes sense. So then, so then where, where do we stand today? How do, do you feel like this has kind of worked through? Mm -hmm. I mean, it, like, are you, are you getting back close to your $100 million a month run rate or are you still a long way away? What, what, what's, how has demand been? You know, we're recording this in the middle of September. How has demand been this month? Yeah, so um, things have been slowly coming back. Uh, everybody kind of cuts the world into pre-COVID, post-COVID. Right. Not really, we're not post-COVID yet. I mean, we're still, the pandemic is still here. I think what's subsided is uh, the panic and the fear over what the market's gonna do, uh, which is typically what causes these downward spirals. 
Um, that fear has subsided. I think people have come to terms with what's happening in the world. People's lives have changed. They've adjusted how they do business. Um, we're in a, we're in a, you know, post COVID era, but it's still very much part of our lives. Um, that being said, uh, because the panic has subsided, uh, capital has been flowing back into the space very quickly. Uh, the securitization markets are back, warehouse lenders are back. So we're starting to see that demand really ramp up and ramp up pretty quickly. Um, from a credit perspective, because all that capital is pouring back into the space and because we actually have a shortage of product, uh, meaning loans, uh, in the space as a result of everybody temporarily pushing pause over the last four, five, six months, um, it's actually pretty much had the direct opposite effect. It's, it's brought hmm. where it was where it, pre-COVID, even though we're still in COVID. So what I mean by that is LTVs are pretty much back where they were, you know, borrower experience requirements, FICO requirements, pretty much anything related to credit underwriting is back to where it was pre-COVID as far as we're concerned. Um, there were some lenders out there that were higher on loan to cost and things like that, uh, that may not be fully back to where they were, but we were ballpark, you know, five to 10 points lower than that competition anyway. So as far as our business is concerned, we're pretty much back to where we were. Um, from a credit perspective, um, from a origination perspective, the, I'm sorry, let me take a step back. From a pricing perspective, I'd say that loans are still pricing probably you know, 50 to 150 basis points higher than we were pre-COVID, but I think very quickly compressed back down to where we were uh, pre-COVID, probably by like January, February. And then from a volume perspective, we just started taking applications, formally taking applications uh, in July. Uh, so what we did <clears throat> from April, May, and June was focus very much on asset management, focusing on funding draws for and supporting borrowers that we were already in bed with. Uh, so the loan activity that we did do was really for existing borrowers that uh, we continue to support. Going into July, we opened that back up to taking applications, not just from our existing borrowers, but from new borrowers. And of course, there's you know, roughly a 30-day ramp. Um, so that, that led us into August, where we closed about 10 million in volume. September, we're looking at probably doing about 20 to 25 million in volume. My goal is by the end of the year to be back up to somewhere around 60, 70 million in volume. Um, I think somewhere towards the end of Q1 or early Q2, we'll be back up to 100 million in volume. But we have to kind of tippy toe back into that because, um, you know, as I mentioned, we're still in a COVID era. We don't know what's going to happen. Uh, and we're also in an election cycle. So it's just, there's a lot of unknowns. Right, right. There is a lot of unknowns and we don't know about stimulus and all that sort of thing. So, um, so what I'm curious about, uh, you know, what you did internally, um, staffing wise, um, because I, I, you obviously, you, you, you went down pretty dramatically in originations and you like, maybe just tell us how you managed the staff and how, and, and like what sort of fur furloughing you did. And then I, 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 I was listening to this interview that said you really, you shifted a whole bunch of people. Um, so you didn't have to lay off that many. So tell us about that. Yeah, so we had pre-COVID about 135 people on staff. We ended up uh, letting go of approximately 25 people. Um, it was not an easy decision at all. Mm -hmm. um, and it's something that we really tried to hold off on doing for several months. We, we didn't do it as quickly as some other companies did, um, meaning generally not lending companies. Um, but eventually we had to make that, that difficult decision. So uh, as far as the rest of the staff, what we tried to do to save as many jobs as possible is just transition them to different departments. So mm -hmm. we were going into a cycle where asset management, loan servicing, um, you know, foreclosure workouts, potentially forbearances, et cetera, we're gonna become a bigger part of our day to day. Uh, so we took people from our processing and underwriting departments. We took people from our sales departments. We moved them into more customer service oriented roles, uh, making sure that they could properly communicate to our investors, to our borrowers, answer incoming calls, things like that, which worked great. Uh, and now we're basically unwinding that and moving people back to the departments that they were initially in as we start right. to run business back. Okay. Okay. That's good. That, that sounds really good. So then um, 
like, cause you know, I'm interesting about the, the, the performance of your loans because, you know, real estate has been interesting because, you know, and real estate's been booming in general. There hasn't been much of a downturn. Obviously you've got, you've got uh, rates that, uh, that have been down, particularly in like in the, in the, you know, home mortgage market. Um, and, you know, prices have, have, you know, either maintained or gone up. So I'm really curious about, the impact on your loan portfolio? Did you find that there was a significant impact, a small impact or, or no impact? There's definitely a significant impact. Um, it was more short lived in nature, but there was definitely a significant, significant impact. Um, there's a lot of misinformation out there over how things are performing. So the residential market is strong. Yes. Right. Um, what many people don't realize though, is that it's not just about selling assets. Many of these developers have, real estate portfolios with renters that they're collecting. Uh -huh. um, and that cash flow is what's supporting their debt service on what I call their offline assets or their mid construction assets. Um, and their cash flow has been impacted. Uh, so if you look, this is, this is more of a local issue rather than a, a national issue because every state county is handling it slightly differently. Um, but kind of two things really caused, one thing really caused a problem, and that was in a, a ban or a moratorium on evictions. Um, you'll see many articles that say that rental collections have been fantastic, north of 90%. The misinformation, the misconception is that that's really specific to like class A, higher end uh, product. Mm -hmm. um, class B and class C, which is more affordable living or single family home, um, you know, that's renting for a couple of thousand dollars a month, $1,500 a month, that's been impacted very differently. Um, the collection rate there, I mean, I've read kind of conflicting things, but I've seen any, anywhere from 50 to 70% collections. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, landlords are down 30 to 50%. Um, if they had any commercial units, obviously the commercial market was impacted very hard. Um, I have several friends that, have, that are commercial landlords that have office space and retail space that's taken a massive hit. Um, which is all cyclical. It's all tied together. Um, so the short answer is that those rental collections dropping made it difficult for many borrowers to meet their debts. Um, so we did see a spike in delinquencies between April, May, June, and even into July. We've seen that subsiding since July. Uh, so borrowers have been able to catch up with payments. Other borrowers we've been successful in executing some forbearances with, which took a few months or two months of back payments added it to the payoff while reinstating the loan for go forward payments um, and, and workouts situations like that. Uh, thankfully, we haven't taken a loss on anything as a result of that. Um, and we've been able to work through that and the performance has come back, thankfully, in a, in a great way. Um, and my expectation is that by the end of October, we'll be at back to where we were pre-COVID in terms of collections. So we should have north, really? of, a, north of a 95% collection rate. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But there will, there will, I imagine there'll be some that, uh, you know, like I'm just thinking about, you know, the one the great thing about what you do is that you have a, you have an asset and you've got, you know, LTVs that are, that are reasonable. So are you, are you finding that you're, you're having to foreclose on some of these, on some of the borrowers that you've had? Definitely. So, some borrowers work with you. Some borrowers think you're their enemy, uh, right. less inclined to work with you. So we will definitely have a subset of borrowers, probably less than 3% of the delinquencies that we're seeing that will actually end up in foreclosure and stay in foreclosure. Um, there are some borrowers that will start the foreclosure process with. Just keep in mind, again, locally, there are moratoriums on foreclosures in many jurisdictions. Right. So we're almost forced to work out and play nice, which I mean, we want to do anyway, but at the same time, we have to protect our investors. Um, so where we can, we're starting those foreclosure actions to apply pressure to the borrowers that are less inclined to work with us. Um, the expectation is that many of those, as we've seen historically, will come out of foreclosure and roll back to a performing status or some sort of a, a resolution, whether that's selling the property, doing a deed in lieu of foreclosure, whatever you know, shape or form that may take. Um, and we're expecting anywhere from like two to 3% of the delinquencies to actually really formally stay in foreclosure and go through foreclosure, which have, you know, very uh, collection timeframes depending on states and what state you're in, geographic location you're in, et cetera. 
But would your expectation be then for no principal loss on, in those foreclosure proceedings? Generally, when we stress test our portfolio, that's the expectation. It doesn't always work out that way. Um, so we've been in business for five and a half years now. We've, of course, had uh, losses. I think on a portfolio measure, we've had about a 50 basis point loss factor um, while delivering you know, north of a 10 and a half percent average return. So you know, net effective 10 percent return on the portfolio. Um, you're going to have losses. It's just right. inevitable. It's an, an, an inevitable part of our business, um, but you also have to look at what's driving those losses sometimes. So we've had scenarios, for example, where we believe that we would be fully made whole on the underlying transaction, but we're looking at a two, two and a half, three year foreclosure timeline. Mm. We've got an investor on the other side who says, nah, I'd rather take 90 cents on the dollar today than have to wait two or three years and carry this loan as a default on our books and you know, that balancing act. Um, so we're sometimes forced into situations where we do have to take a worse deal. Um, but that's our job as a servicer in that instance is to listen to our investors. So some of that like 50 basis point loss, for example, can be actually a lot of it could be attributed to kind of those investor forced sale scenarios. Right. Right. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. So then how, um, when you're, when you're sourcing new deals today, are you, you said you're back working with new, with new borrowers. I mean, how is the way you're trying to source deals? Has that changed over the, uh, you know, since from what you were doing pre pre COVID? No, not really. We've never, um, we've never really done a whole lot of online marketing and advertising. Most of our origination volume was coming the old fashioned way. Right. On marketing, you know, in person events, that sort of stuff, which obviously you can't do right now. <laughs> um, <Unaware. laughs> yeah. So, so we are, I think we're still at a phase where there's more limited capital than there is borrower demand because a lot of lenders still haven't come back to the space. So we're actually seeing borrowers naturally find us. We're seeing brokers come to us with deals as well. Um, so we have probably have more deals than we know what to do at this point. Um, so we're not really doing a lot of outbound marketing for borrowers. Right. Right. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. So then what well, I'm curious about your, your take on, on sort of the, you know, this little niche of the industry that we're in where you've got, you've got a marketplace, you're doing these, you know, um, commercial, you know, you know, fix and flip type of type loans. Um, what, what do you think the impact of the pandemic is going to have on this sort of niche in the industry? Long term, um, not much. I think in the short term, it's what we've been describing. There's going right. to be shortage of capital for a period of time. Um, you're going to see wider pricing as a result of that. Um, but my expectation is that, assuming we don't end up in another massive shutdown of the economy, that that will eventually roll back to where we were pre-COVID. I don't think that lasts. You know, I don't think that change is going to take more than six months, eight months right. from where. We're Right, right. Okay, okay. So we're almost out of time. So uh, last question then, you know, as, as you look to 2021, and I'm sure most of us are looking forward to uh, a new year, um, to have 2020 behind us, you know, what, what are you excited about? What are, what are your goals for the business for, for next year? Yeah, so we have a couple of exciting initiatives. Um, so aside from continuing to grow our core business, uh, we have plans to launch an NPL, non-performing loan marketplace, recognizing that you know, there will be defaults that, that happen as a result of the COVID pandemic. Um, there will be a need for certain lenders to have to, lenders and aggregators to have to offlay those. Um, so we're actually targeting, I think, November or December for a launch of our NPL marketplace, mm -hmm. uh, which is really built as a full end-to-end -end automated service for buyers and sellers to interact through an organized platform, streamline the uh, process for selling a non-performing loan, um, and hopefully get better execution for the seller. Uh, and then separately from that, we're also starting a business purpose loan servicing platform. Uh, one of the things that we've learned in being in this business and really in the investor non-QM business for the 30-year mortgage product is that um, many of the loan servicers that are out there are, uh, are servicing consumer mortgage purpose loans as well. Um, so they're, they're kind of shackled and limited in how they service business purpose loans because their policies and procedures are set up 
in light of, you know, CFPB regulations, consumer regulations, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, and that does not make for a great servicing platform per se for, for uh, business purpose loans. So we have that as an offshoot as well, which we're excited about launching. And um, you know, those are two kind of new sister platforms to share states that I think are gonna hopefully make a big splash. Very interesting. Well, well, good luck with that. Uh, Alan, it's been great to chat with you again and uh, best of luck uh, as we na all navigate the pandemic. Thank you so much. Appreciate it, Peter. Thanks for okay. having me. My pleasure. See you.